Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week, I am very excited to welcome our guest who has recently became someone that I would call a friend. And hopefully they feel the same way and we continue to cultivate that friendship because he has many things that I like in air arsenal, guns, so on and so forth, and lives in a pretty phenomenal place. And anytime people have a place they can go and practice shooting guns and everything, I just want to be your friend. That's all I want. I just want to be your friend. But no, seriously, so much more than that. This week's guest uh, is a pastor out in Arizona, and it's got a phenomenal story, uh, phenomenal ministry that he's doing there in Arizona with some others as well. So without further ado, I do want to welcome this week's guest, Pastor Francisco Arbelita. Uh, maybe I said that right. I don't know if I said that right. This is difficult. I told him earlier, my, my Spanish is bad, my English is worse, and he's got a difficult name. So from here on out, he's just Pastor Francisco. Francisco, thank you so much for being a part of the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. Come on, man. I'm excited. I'm so proud of you. You said my name with perfection, according to the English language, and I'm so (laughs) proud of you. And uh, thank you so much for having me on. I I am uh, truly blessed and humbled to be here. And I'm not just saying that. I I looked at your lineup of of guests that you've had. We have some mutual friends there, but what an honor to be in such great company. And uh, you are definitely my friend for life. You don't have a choice. We love me. We love guns. We love Jesus. We love family. We have so much in common. The only thing that we don't have in common is our gorgeous hair. Oh, Lord have mercy. He's got those wavy locks, y'all. Uh, those that are listening and not watching online, he's got that wavy lock look, and I'm kind of thinning on one side, and it just makes me a little bit jealous, but nevertheless. Uh, I, I said the last name right, so I'm not going to butcher it for the rest of the time. From here on out, it'll just be Francisco. But nevertheless, give us a little bit of history of who you are for those that may not be familiar with who you are to share with us where you're from, what you're doing, family life. Give us any detail you want personally about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, glad to share. I actually come from really humble roots. Um, my, I was originally born in Chicago, Illinois. And about the age of five, my family went west to Las Vegas. I grew up in Las Vegas for uh, 20 some odd years. And in that time, I came to know Jesus as a young boy. I grew up in a uh, local Baptist church there in Las Vegas. Um, Outside of the glitz and the glamour, so to speak, and all of the entertainment uh, that's there in Las Vegas, Vegas, uh, there are amazing people and amazing churches. And uh, I happened to grow up in some of those amazing communities and uh, learned about the Lord young in my age. Uh, I was about five, six years old, roughly after we moved there and eventually grew up, uh, played a lot of soccer, a lot of soccer. I loved soccer. It was amazing. And uh, met my beautiful wife in the church that we grew up in. And uh, we've been married for, will be 20 years this November. And we have five children. They range from the ages of 18 to 10. And uh, great kids. They're all, they're all doing amazing. They love the Lord and they are just amazing kids. And uh, after a while of being raised in Las Vegas, I found myself in Arizona. And uh, I b- totally believe the Lord shifted me and brought me this way. I was uh, in construction. I studied construction management in college. Uh, Even soccer helped pay for a little bit of that. And that was amazing. And uh, just was doing family life. And then lo and behold, the Lord had other plans. And uh, so I started serving in ministry, uh, not just going to church, but actually started serving in ministry. And what that looked like is for the first, uh, I wanna say 13 years, of my of my ministerial calling it was just folding chairs and packing up book tables and you know washing windows cutting grass doing all those things but i did it with all the joy in my heart and uh uh, now looking back i can see that's why ultimately the lord blessed me 
and uh, called me into ministry. And um, it's been a great, great life. I mean, it's, we've had ups and downs as a family. I think we've all experienced challenges in, in society in, in certain ways. And uh, here we are now, planted, pastoring, serving a community, and uh, raising a, a body of bold believers to go and do what God has called us to do, which is the Great Commission. It's an interesting journey, uh, except for that one aspect of soccer. That's where we got to work on this relationship <laughs> yeah. right here, bro. Yeah. I mean, your love of soccer might need therapy. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just, it's not a real sport. I mean, I can't, you know, yeah, I get harassed a lot, but I just want to remind you and your listeners that soccer is the number one global sport oh, in the world. Please. So just, so just so you know, billions of people agree with me. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. Have you seen those people? Yeah. I've said, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so yeah. no, I love to give where I'm from in the deep South. Everybody knows there's only three sports and uh, three real sports. Oh, yeah. Come on. And um, those are the three real sports of the world. But, you know, this football, um, football is something, yeah. you know, I love to kind of pick at. I, you know, my youngest daughter, her boyfriend is an amateur soccer player. So, oh, wow. Uh, I just, I constantly, pick and, and claw and everything so I, I can do it with francisco as well so yeah absolutely you're pastoring now how long have you have have you been in the role of pastoring five years actually five years this june so i'm relatively new on the scene as far as ministerial call uh very much i grew up in the church like i said earlier since the age of five so i've been in church all my life um i've always naturally have had a draw to the Lord, things of the supernatural, the way he does things. I love God. I love Jesus. Uh, I love the stories. I love the experiences. I love what he does for people. I love the miracles. I love the way he talks to us. I love everything about him. He is such a good father, savior, redeemer, counselor. I mean, I just love everything about him. And so even though I didn't uh, necessarily serve uh, in a mystery, ministerial call all my life, I have loved the Lord. And um even in my years where as a young man, I found myself kind of, you know, falling away from church because I was distracted with things of the world. I still always tithed. I still always believed in the Lord. There was things that just resonated in me that just stayed even early as a young man, as a, as a boy, that were planted in me that just never departed. And, uh, you know, when hard times came, I found myself on the rock. And, uh, and so I'm grateful for that. And so the Lord's always been good to me. And uh, for the last, like I said, 12 years, uh, well, actually, it's been about 16 years total that I've been serving uh, in the church. But five years, I've been the pastor. And, and only in those five years have I been actually walking out the call of pastor, even though I do believe that God gave me that call, even as a young man. That's interesting, because you said that even though there was times that you know, you straight off, you had things that were firmly planted in you, rooted in you. Absolutely. Who, what was, who was that, that was so instrumental at a young age in your life? Yeah, my parents, you know, they, they, they did the best they could. Um, I think my parents, my parents were phenomenal people. They are. And uh, my parents were just the kind of people that said, you know, son, it's time to go to church. And I, I do believe that, uh, culture has changed a bit, but in my day, when I was growing up, I'm 40 years old now, when I was growing up, uh, church is just what you did, and you obeyed your parents, and you went, and you did, and I, we, I did have the faithful praying grandmother, I absolutely did, uh, I, had a, I have a very faithful praying mother who, who attends our church, has been living in Maricopa now for three years, and attends our church as well, and loves to serve as a greeter, and, and be with the people, uh, and intercessory prayer as well. And that's evident <laughs> uh, because she brought me back. Uh, but that's really where the influence came from. It was praying people. And, and I've always, I've always leaned in towards obedience. I've always been an obedient person. I'm, I, I, by character, I'm a very loyal person. Uh, and so that's, that's really, those are the gifts that God has put inside of me that, that were evident, even in my years of uh, rebellion. It, because you're saying something there, loyal. I think. Oh, absolutely. Loyalty is one of those things that has been in the recent, maybe 
10, 15 years has been something that has been tried to redefine. And we have people that aren't necessarily uh, walking in the understanding of loyalty. So what I want to when you say that you're a very loyal person, what does that mean to you? Yeah, a lot of times um, for me, uh, what comes out of naturally that I call loyalty, I think, is, is absolutely a gift that God has given me. And some would call it servant, some would call it slave. Uh, but ultimately, it's my draw uh, to and how I've always perceived my walk with the Lord. Um, if I could give you an example, even biblically, I would even just say loosely right now, the prodigal son, right? We love that story. You and I love that story. And there's many that do. And there's many have preached amazing messages regarding the prodigal son. And rather than choosing to see myself as a son who went away and came back, I've chosen to see myself as a son that stayed. And um, I honor that story because the son that stayed uh, for me is the one that inherits. He inherited the farm. He inherited everything else. And so I've always drawn naturally to those things. Um, I don't know exactly, I'll be honest, I don't know exactly how that came about me. I just have always done it. And you could say culturally, like for Hispanics, uh, there is, uh, loyalty is huge, uh, culturally speaking, but there's also the, the divine things that God does in our life. And I do believe that he has given me this divine ability to be loyal. And that doesn't mean that I'm under anyone per se, but that at the same time, I understand leadership. I understand my authority. Look at, the, look at the centurion who came to Jesus and said, heal my daughter. I love his comment. And I just tell you his comment. His comment was, I know you can send the word because he knew authority. He said, because I'm under authority. He didn't say because I'm a centurion of a legion. He didn't start to uh, proclaim and prophesy his position. He literally said, because I'm under authority. And I've always known that when I'm under authority, that I am blessed by the authority above me. And ultimately, my highest authority is my heavenly father and Jesus. And so, so I'm under his authority. And being under his authority, uh, honestly, it, it, it shapes my heart, Ryan. Uh, being a loyal man has shaped my heart. Because I am loyal, even when I'm struggling with things in my heart or in my mind, even, even about current world leaders today, I can submit my heart to the Lord because I'm under his authority. I'm loyal to God. And uh, you know, I don't know if that answers the question, but this, this is where I begin to find what God is doing in my life. I do believe it answers the question of how you define it and stuff. Now I want to ask, because I love the way that you respond to that. Why is that such a challenge for when I say this generation, I'm not talking about young people. I'm talking about everybody that is breathing right now. Yeah. Why is loyalty one of those things that people stay, uh, have trouble staying committed to? And then on the flip side of it, how it's abused. Yeah. I think the, the thing that, that allows me to stay connected to loyalty is my trust in the heavenly father. Like mm -hmm. I trust that he is good. So he doesn't have to show me that he's good. I'm choosing to believe that he is good because when I read the Bible, okay. Uh, and I go through the pages of the Bible and I build my relationship with God. I can see that over and over again in the pages of the Bible, he is faithful. And so for that to me begins to show me uh, that I can trust in him and I'm not trusting in him because I'm expecting for him to do something. I'm trusting in him because he's just good. He's yeah. good at everything he does. He's good in correcting me and he's good in fixing uh, the issue, whatever's going on. And so I just choose to trust in him no matter what. And I could say that in this season of epidemic, there are far more, uh, how can I say this, like deeper epidemics that are happening than what we see in the natural. Now, for anyone who's been hurt by COVID, we're praying for you. Uh, we're believing God's best for you. I'm not taking any, anything away from this, but I do believe that fear, mistrust, panic, those are the epidemics that are at stake here that are shifting a nation or nations uh, to 
actually not even trust anymore. We can't trust in what the government is saying. We can't trust in what some of the leaders are saying. In fact, we have a mistrust that's brewing inside of us. And so for that reason, I think those are pictures and how we begin to lose trust even in God. And uh, my heart is to always draw close to the Lord in my time of need and not just in my time in need of it, all the time, but really when things like this start happening, you know, when the, when the epidemic started hitting, uh, when COVID started hitting, everyone started fearing, right? And it, it was driving this. And so we have to trust the Lord that he knows what, what he's doing. And uh, God, I don't believe God caused uh, COVID, but I do believe that he does use it. The Bible says that he's, he turns these things for our good. And, uh, and so that's what I feel right now is happening. I think that we're, we're, we're at a, at a, uh, literally at a point where we're going to have to decide, am I going to choose to trust in the Lord or not? And, uh, loyalty is going to be very important, uh, because it allows us to trust in the Lord, no matter what we see in front of us. That's so good. So here you are at five years of pastoring, but in the midst of the five years, there is that pandemic. There is oh, the the COVID and stuff. What is that? What has your journey been like? Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, you know, talk about I, ever since I came in to be a pastor, I, I kind of feel like I was thrown into the fire, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and what I mean by that, uh, radically supernaturally, absolutely. But, you know, you could go to Bible school and I love Bible school. You go to Bible school and you can get a lot of great training, but it's in the real world that you begin to see uh, God, you know, really move. Um, you know, like I love that God moves in church, but it's in our encounters out in the world that we see the miracle working power of God. I'm not saying that miracles don't happen in the church. Please don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, is that it's just different. Uh, it, it definitely is different. Talk about being in the fire. My first week being a pastor here was praying for a baby to be resurrected. That was hard. That was hard. I mean, how, how do you do this? Right. And we had a situation where triplets were born and they were all, uh, uh, said that they were, you know, they, they had to be born early and they were all struggling for their life. And this woman calls and she wants Patricia King to come. You know, I, I work with Patricia King and Robert Hodgkin and uh, they wanted Patricia King to come. And honestly, so would I. And uh, she's an amazing person. She's uh, she's she loves the Lord God. I mean, her childlike faith is unbelievable. And and Robert, I mean, Robert's one of my mentors. I think you've had Robert on your show, too. And Robert's uh, he's both a friend of ours. And I mean, God just use him in mighty ways. And so I got the privilege of going out there and two of the babies survived. One went on to be with the Lord, uh, but we were praying for all three babies to be alive. And so what do you do in those situations? And so all of my pastoral, my pastorate has been like this. It's been challenges by fire, but to this, I call, uh, uh, this is what I would call acceleration. <laughs> I know a lot of people would call it fire and hard. And some people would even want to quit. And believe you me, there was times when I wanted to quit because I wasn't sure of what was happening. But because of my loyal heart, I stayed in the game, so to speak. I stayed, I kept going after it. I kept going after it, kept going after it. And yeah, there's been amazing victories in the process as well. Uh, no one in our church got COVID. And so there's been, there's been amazing testimonies of what God has done through, you know, in, in, in the midst of the people uh, here at Shiloh Fellowship in Maricopa, Arizona. But essentially, like, this is what my life has been like as a pastor. It's, it's been me having to prove my loyalty, so to speak, or walking out my loyalty uh, with the Lord and with those that, that, that I follow, that, that lead here with me and that, I, and that, uh, that we grow together. It's not been easy. Uh, these five years have been challenging. But as I look back, I say, thank you, God. Because all my life I was crying out, or at least going into ministry, I was crying out, Lord, use me, use me, use me. And then he did. And so now I say, praise God, let's keep going. So what does that look like, though, when you are, you're recognizing these challenges by fire? At the same time, you're a father, mm -hmm. a husband. Um you know, you're a person in the community. 
And the whole world is filled not only with fear, but with questions of the unknown. Absolutely. How are you, how are you able to, I, I guess the word I'm looking for is make sure that you are remaining focused on Francisco, the individual, because if you don't focus on you as a son of God, it will, it'll roll over into the pastoral side, the husband side, the father side, the community. What are some of the key elements that you are doing to cultivate yourself because of these intense fires? Absolutely. That's such a good question. I, you know, for me, uh, right away, uh, I'm going to be the typical Christian. I'm going to tell you your relationship with Christ has to be at the center. Your focus on the Bible, his word, his voice, the things that he wants to do with you, through you, for you, because of you, all these good things has to be at the center. Your life with Jesus Christ has to be at the center. And more than the mission, it's the relationship. More than what I what he wants me to do, I want to be at his feet. It's like the Peter and John. Peter's uh, Jesus is walking with Peter in, uh, I believe it's John chapter 21, you know, he's walking with Peter on the, on the side of the, the, the lake there, the side of the ocean. He's saying, follow me, follow me, follow me. He keeps telling them. But at one point they look back and they look at John and uh, just so that everybody knows, John was not invited on the walk with Peter and Jesus, but John did it anyways. And every time John is mentioned in the Bible, he's either on the chest of Jesus. He's sitting next to him at the table. He's following him. He wasn't invited. He just did it. And because he knew who Jesus was. And so just constantly following Jesus, no matter what has to be ultimate. Your relationship with Jesus has to take center stage. Number two for me is accountability. Absolute accountability. Uh, I have mentors in my life that I can go to and I can just let it all out. I can just let it all out whether it sounds faithless, whether it sounds doubtful, whether it sounds great, whether it sounds amazing and on fire or whatever that looks like. I have mentors that I can go to that are going to help me steer me back in the right direction. And I've lent myself to that. I think the danger uh, for a leader, ultimate danger for a leader is roaming around like a lone wolf. Like I'm so grateful that there's so many ministers who are powerful, but I'll tell you whether it's Daniel Kalinda or Todd White or whoever met, you know, most, most of our favorite preachers and ministers, they have accountability teams. They have people they can go to. And these accountability teams aren't there's just there for me to go to and say, I don't understand this, but they're also there to come and challenge me when I say something, when I act on something, when I do something. And because they have inventory in my heart, because I am loyal to them and they are loyal to me, then it allows me to be able to hear and to process safely in a place where I can then become a better minister and become a better man. Uh, my relationship with my family, you know, I have to be very careful the way I guide that. So number three, what is that family life look like as a pastor? And I have to learn, uh, you know, you probably be, I've heard this before, but I do have to learn how to be a father and how to be a pastor. When I'm at home, I'm not a pastor. When I'm at home, I'm part of the family unit. When I'm there, I'm not there necessarily to just be the visionary of the family or the provider of the family, but I'm there to be a servant in the family as well, because my kids need me on a different level. My wife needs me on a different level. That's a, that's a place of intimacy there that they're required. They, they need me uh, to be there. But you know what, Ryan, I need them. I need my children. I need my wife. I need them in my, in my, in my life, right? Just as much as I need my friends. I, I need my my friends. And I'm also very careful of those that I let into my life. Uh, you know, uh, so I'm looking for people that, uh, uh, you know, whether it's where I want to be or people that I think are, are highly of people that I respect, uh, all these things, you know, just like the, the, I'm careful with the ministers that I listen to, you know, who are they? Uh, so equally in that, in that regard too. And then ultimately for me, uh, the big thing is, is, uh, again, more than just coming to serve is, uh, or more than coming to preach is to serve, sorry, uh, more than just coming to preach. I'm just, I'm not just looking. God, God gives us the right things to say. I, in his awesomeness, he gives us the right things to say, okay? But the difference between uh, something really good and something deep is based on my relationship with Christ. And so uh, for me, that comes through my servant, through my servant uh, led or servanthood, uh, even in the church. You know, for years, I cut grass and I 
washed windows and I do stuff. And, you know, when I got to get back to the basics, when things are really hard, I go back to the basics. I used to have a soccer coach that would always tell us this in the middle of these intense uh, matches, get back to the basics. And I've always remembered this. And for me, servanthood is going back to the basics. So one of the ways I hit reset in my life when things are going hard is I go back to a place where I can serve the people. And it's simple. And it could be putting up a bed. It could be uh, it could be stacking some chairs. It could be something. It's not, it, I'm not defined, uh, you know, like I'm not, how can I say, like, I don't lose my pastor authority by doing those things, but I'm hitting the reset button. I'm going back to the basics and I'm asking God, okay, let's start over. What am I missing? And so one of the ways that I do that in action is by going back to serve. Now, uh, the busier I get, sometimes I feel like the less time I have for that, but I never want to let go of that humble heart that says, Lord, I want to go back to the beginning. And, and for me, uh, I think Peter did that. You know, he went back to fishing and uh, he was just trying to go back to the basics. He was trying to go back to the beginning. And I'm so grateful that Jesus met him where he was at. And I think sometimes when I get, when this gets overwhelming, uh, going back to the basics, Jesus meets me where, he, where I'm at and he reminds me, follow me. Mm. And, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. It really is. What do you think is, as, as you, let's, let's talk about you, Pastor, and what do you think is the heartbeat of going forward? Because we're coming out of this COVID world. We're coming out of it. It's, you know, it's a, it's a slow process, but we are eventually making our way out of it. We'll be hopefully not, not too much longer past the face mask, past the mandates, past all this stuff. What is your focus as a pastor concerning the body of Christ and the people that you lead? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of Christians have had some really great secluded time uh, with the Lord uh, being at home and, you know, having all these stay at home mandates. I pray that they were connecting with God. I do believe that in a lot of ways they were. I do believe that God helped reset a lot of people and go back to the basics, you know, the dinner table, so to speak. And, uh, you know, conversations, I've seen people remodel their homes and do all these wonderful things, put their lives back in order. And so I think all those things are beautiful. What I want to see happen now as people are coming back into society, so to speak, as Christians are, are launched back into the world, is that they would uh, fulfill the greatest commandment, which is to love to love and to look for opportunities to love. I am eager to see people looking out for each other. I'm eager to see Christians in the church, not just uh, not being secluded so much anymore, like where they're hermitized, but they're literally looking out for the well-being of their neighbors and that they're not scared uh, of the pandemic. Listen, our, our days are numbered. We don't know when they come, but let's live every day to the fullest. And if that means that you're helping your neighbor fix their car or you're, you know, uh, prophesying over someone's life at Starbucks, like whatever that looks like for you. Uh, I just want to encourage you just go for it, go for it each day, get out of it. And uh, we do need to, I, I, what I'm, what I'm scared of is that the hermitization, I'm going to make up my own word here is where people have been so reclused in their home and they've been going just YouTube in the gospel that they forget that we have to exercise the gospel right? Mm. And so it's amazing to learn, but it's better to exercise. You know, that's why love is an action word, because it's, it's, uh, it's what we do that speaks louder than what we say. And so I, my hope and my prayer is that as the church begins to come back, uh, that they actually walk this out, that they go out into the world and do what they're called to do uh, and not be scared. That's a really, really good point, because I think a lot of people, you know, um, I did not say this originally, Mario Morello said this, that uh, we seen we're no longer a slave to fear, but a virus proved that wrong. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of fear that is happening throughout the body of Christ and across the world. The fear of the unknown is, is, a, is a challenge, but so much of our walk with the Lord is dependent upon faith. You know, that's just the reality of it. And I'm not saying that faith is the opposite of fear. That's not what I mean in that whatsoever. There are things that fear is going to come, but where we put our faith, our hope, and our trust is, is the, you know, the antidote of fear in that sense. And that's where I wonder as individuals, what are we really caught up in? Do we know more of what the word of God says versus what Fox News or CNN says? Or do we know what more Jesus said? Or do we know more what 
the Fouch says, you know, and, and those are challenging in that, but it, it's, it's just, it's, it, I can't imagine being a pastor right now. I, my heart goes out to pastors because there's so much of a dynamic that you guys got to, to juggle in all this. But even with that, your house specifically, Shallow Fellowship, it's a prophetic house. It's an apostolic house, but it's also a house that is pursuing revival. Yeah. Can you articulate what that actually means? Because I think a lot of people have become accustomed to revival being the catchphrase, the hashtag, yeah. you know, Very good. so when you are saying that Shiloh fellowship is pursuing revival, expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Because we have an apostolic call into the nations, uh, you know, and, and, and the different things that the assignments that God gives us when we're talking about revival, we're literally talking about two things. One is the understanding that we need CPR to the soul fast. I mean, we need a lightning bolt to the, I mean, there, there's a, only one thing that really turns the hearts of, of uh, the people towards God and that's his power. And then they have an encounter with his love and then they're wrecked and they're never the same. And then we decree over them that they never go back. <laughs> but uh, but reality is like for me, every time I think of revival, I literally think of CPR to the soul. We need an injection of holiness. We need an injection of righteousness. I mean, when you look uh, at at in as in the days of Noah, for example, that phrase. I mean, there was some there was some really hard things going on, and people were just blatant about sin. And they did not care. There was no reverence for God. There was no fear of God. There was no fear of the Bible or, or reverence towards the word of God. There was no respect for the church. You know, ministers used to carry a different type of uh, respect even among the community. But whether it's, you know, I, I wish I could tell you that it was just the sin of the world, but unfortunately we find ourselves in a day where even things have been exposed in the church. And so absolutely yeah. we need God. So when I'm talking about revival, what, what my prayer is to articulate is that the love of God would be made so real that it would, that literally the supernatural would manifest into the natural, that our love for God would take center stage so much so that no matter what happens, we choose to trust him. I'm talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego moments type of stuff. You know, I'm talking about where my loyalty to God is so strong that no matter what happens next, it doesn't matter. I'm going to choose to believe God come hell or high water. And that to me is how we begin to see an injection of, of uh, you know, supernatural CPR into the, into the soul of, of society and, and of the church. Hungry people, thirsty people, people that desire. Now, when you talk about revival to a, a room full of faith, uh, people full of faith, um, there is, uh, how can I say, like a forward motion, like, when you deliver that and it comes through the through God, like there there is some forward momentum, but uh, but what happens is is that it feels really good in church, but we leave church and then we forgot about the call or the mission, and really like the only way we're going to be able, in my opinion, Ryan, the only way that we're actually going to be able to see a worldwide revival. And just so you know, when I pray, when I'm praying revival, I'm not just praying for Shiloh to have revival. I'm praying for every church in America or the world to have revival. We want it to come over. The, it's actually even bigger. Let me just actually break down even what we're, what we're seeing right now, just so that people understand we're prophesying or, or we feel that we're receiving from the Lord something called a bridal revival, which is the church of God coming into such a manifestation of the love of Jesus Christ that it would manifest in the natural to the point where, you know, when it talks about the glorious bride of Christ, well, that glory has to be shown and it has to be seen and it has to be heard. And so what begins to happen, if you picture yourself in a wedding, when the bride enters the room, uh, the music changes, uh, the story changes, right? They, like you, everyone's at attention and people stand up and there's a reverence and there's a, this, this excitement that comes. And that's for me is like the picture of a bridal revival. Like I want the whole church of Christ to, to experience revival. We're not just sitting here in the corner of Arizona praying that God would bless our church okay we're asking god to move sovereignly over the entire world and jesus said or god says in uh you know john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave us his son that's for everyone that's for it that's for everybody and so our heart is that there would be a global revival what we're calling a bridal revival 
that's what we're praying for. And we believe that God wants to show us some things in that. And we, and our mandate, listen, whether it breaks out with us, I do believe that it's going to break out in multiple places. I know our, uh, our common friend, Ren had a word uh, a while back that it was like geysers and I received something similar. I just saw geysers blowing up everywhere all over the world. And these were, these were areas where God is going to, I believe, uh, areas where God is going to just explode with revival, but they were happening all at the same time. And I just think, man, wouldn't that be amazing if revival just broke out in all kinds of places at once, not just one place, but all kinds of places at once? I mean, that, that would be, for me, like, you can't tell me this ain't God. Like science is not going to be able to put a label on that one. Government will not be able to put a label on that one. Mm -hmm. Man will not be able to put a label on those things. Those things are of God. And so those are the things that we're crying out for essentially. And again, I pray that articulates it. I'm just, I get excited when I think about it and I don't want to use it as a cliche phrase, although we know it's been, uh, I think it's been watered down. But I think yeah. even in that, we need to, when we're talking about revival, there's a reverence and a fear for God that hits man like, like we've never seen or experienced. And, and I don't want to just go to a revival. I want to be revival. I want God to use me in this, in this uh, life for something wonderful that brings him glory. Uh, and so that's what we're looking at. It's personal revival. It's global revival. It's church revival. And it's the bridal revival. I think a lot of people will be hearing this or watching this and going, yes. That's exactly what I'm feeling. That's, you know, that's the thing. But there are these walls. There are these uh, hindrances. What are some of the things that is stopping this from occurring? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I tell you what, like, I don't, I don't know what they all are, but I'll give you my perspective on what I feel one is, is people have, um, we were talking about this early, we we're talking about loyalty, we we're talking about, Uh, trust. I think there's a mistrust that God exists. I think there's a mistrust that God loves. I think there's a a mistrust that God will heal me or touch me or save me in some way. And uh, I think that we have to, in in essence, uh, how can I say this? Like, I don't think we, it's not that we have to do something because it should be the example of our life that, that speaks to people. Uh, however, I do feel that we have a mission or a mandate uh, to help people trust in the Lord again. And, uh, you know, I was reading early this morning in my devotion, the story of the parables uh, in Matthew 25. I've been in Matthew 25 a lot. In fact, our whole church has been in Matthew 25 a lot. And there's three stories there inside of Matthew 25. It's the, the story of the, of the 10 virgins, right? The five foolish mm-hmm. and the five wise. Um, the chapter closes out with the sheep and goat nations, Jesus separating sheep and goat nations. And when I say goat, I don't mean greatest of all time. I mean, uh, bat, right. <laughs> yeah, actual annoying goats. And then, uh, but in the middle of that, he tells a story of the parable of the talents. And a lot of people look at that story and absolutely the things that have been preached are amazing. Uh, stewarding your talents and all this stuff. But I do believe that that story under in the underlining of it is about trusting the master because mm-hmm. the, the third man, the man who was given one, he went and buried his talent. He took his own authority and he had mistrust in what the master was calling him into. And he didn't trust that good things could happen to him. And so he went and buried that talent. And then when the master came back checking for it, he judged the master for it. So <clears throat> If I could say what has happened a lot to people is that there has been a mistrust in God. And then we come back and we judge God. You hear people say, well, if God is so good, how could he do this? Right. Yeah. And so I do believe that uh, that that authority, that self-authority that we take on ourselves, there has to be a shift in that. And the only way that that happens is if you understand that there is a God. And so there are things that have to happen. I believe this is me, my own perspective, my own word. I believe there's things that have to happen that you look at and you say, that could only be God. And we have to have an encounter, such a radical encounter. You know, like when when crazy things start happening, church ministers and leaders, don't be surprised. God is shaking. Whenever an awakening comes, there has to be a shaking. If somebody comes and wakes you up, if you're in a deep nap, okay, what has to happen? Someone's going to come and shake you to wake you up. 
There has to be a shakening for there to be an awakening. And so that's what's happening to us. And, and for, in order for people to, 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 uh, to come into a relationship or a life union with Jesus, they're going to have to begin to trust him again. And so for that, I say, that is why the miracle signs and wonders come. That is why the power of God comes because it's, it, it is an open door for people to have a relationship with God and begin to trust in him. It's interesting because now my wheels are turning because with everything that we've been through since late 2019 to now, it does feel like a majority of people. I don't know if this is the right word or not, but they lost their trust in the Lord because they were being told so many things um, from the television, from the media, from so on and so forth. And, and somewhere along the way we lost or stop trusting the Lord. And so what I'm wondering is, do you feel like part of this bridal revival is also hinged on recognizing the lack of trust in order to have the renewal? In, in other words, I, I guess where my mind is rolling in this is, you know, there was a time I uh, I was married the first time to my wife and, and I put her through hell during that first marriage. Uh, that first year of marriage, sorry. And I was born again in our second year of marriage. And so um, it was a goal of mine on our fifth anniversary to renew our vows because I messed up that first year. Now we were still married the entire time, but we went through the renewal of our vows. Nothing really changed except it was something personal for me and her in that process. Now this November, we'll be married 25 years. Do you think, I'm, I'm saying that to say, because this is where my mind's going, do you think there has to be that renewal of trust? Yeah. Because that is something that you're saying. You're talking about that trust and, and, and so on and so forth, but I don't think it's as simple yes. as, okay, I'm just going to start trusting the Lord again. There needs to be that process of renewal. Does that make sense to what I'm saying? Absolutely. I love the way you said that. You know, um, not too long ago, we were talking with some of the leaders and we said, how do we get to this point where we need revival? The reality is that since the garden, God has been getting, trying to get us back to that place. Jesus comes, he fulfills the mandate, but yet here we are still 2000 plus years later, waiting for an outpouring, waiting for revival. And, and we get hints of it throughout history uh, with all the different revivals that there has been. Uh, you know, for me in my lifetime, I got to witness Toronto Revival. I got to witness Pineapple Revival. Now, I didn't actually go to them, but I got to see the leaders that came from them. I got to see the videos because of things like YouTube, uh, Red Books, seeing leaders, all these things. And so all that's beautiful. Uh, but to answer the question, or at least to begin to look at the question about does there need to be uh, a moment where trust is renewed? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love the picture that you gave. I, I absolutely love the picture you gave. Like you decided in your heart that you wanted to do something that would signify the renewal of your commitment to your spouse. And I believe that's a great picture. You said it better than I did. That is a great picture for revival. We need something to happen where we are, our, our uh, love for God is literally renewed. And uh, more than revival, I mean, you can, you can call it reformation, you can call it awakening. We're all trying to pinpoint, we, we all feel that there is something on the brink of happening that is beyond words, and we have probably no grid for it. And the reason I say that is because whenever Jesus reappeared after the resurrection, he appeared with so much glory that people didn't recognize him. And so I believe that's the Jesus we need to see where so much glory comes in that it's unrecognizable and that will fuel exactly what you're saying, which is a renewed commitment or renewed vow or renewed, uh, covenant, <clears throat> sorry, covenant, if you will, with God, the father. And, uh, I love how you said that, man, you just preached a great message there. <laughs> it, it, I, I have to walk things out to be able to understand it clearly. So, um, that's, growing up in the state of Alabama, we're slow to yeah. process sometimes, but we love the process here, man. We, we will sit down and process for hours. We, we don't mind at all because we are, we are hunting down understanding, uh, and we're not trying to limit it. And we want to make sure that, that 
like me, Francisco, doesn't get in the way of that which God wants to do. And that's why we process. I think it's fascinating because you, you said that a key phrase there, beyond words, because I think a lot of people listening, a lot of people watching, and they're sitting here and they're going, yeah, I'm, I'm going to trust God again. Or yes, I'm going to pursue revival. But I, I'm, I'm questioning because how much of it is words versus how much of it is is actual the renewal process of it, you know, because in my heart, I purpose to do that on the fifth anniversary, but had I not done it and only purpose it in my heart, what good would it have been? And I think a lot in the body of Christ right now are purposing a lot of things, but not staying committed to follow through those things. And that, well, this is where, but. yeah, this is where you, you know, you and I probably feel the same way about this is where actions speak louder than words. As you know, a phrase that's been used a ton, uh, but literally such a true phrase is needed right now to walk out. L actions speak louder than words. Uh, I'll give you an example. My neighbor, God bless them. They're amazing people. And when I first moved into that neighborhood, you know, I was so caught up and so busy with family life and church life that I never really got to reach out to my neighbors. And yeah, I said hi. And I was very polite um, because uh, just I'm, I'm a lovable person. Uh, and so one day, you know, uh, my neighbor says to me, hey, man, uh, let me tell you a story. I got, you know, he rides his bike every day to work and he got hit and wrecked his bike. And he says, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I just said, man, can I pray for you? Good Christian thing to say. Can I pray for you? And he says, well, what's that going to do? And I said, well, let's just see. So we started praying for him. And I, and I literally, I prayed for his body. I prayed for him to be healed. But I also prayed for a new bike. And when I prayed for a new bike for him, he said, why would God give me a new bike? And I said, how about we believe God for a new bike? And he said, okay, prove it. And I said, you got it. You know, and I'm really like, really going out on a limb here. But just as I said that, I get a phone call from a member of the church. It says, pastor, I don't know why I'm calling you, but I have a brand new bicycle. It's a men's bicycle. And I just felt like I needed to call you and ask you if there's anyone in need that needs a bicycle. Now that's a beautiful story. But you know what caused that miracle to happen? My actions. My actions caused that miracle to happen. My, my uh, decision to put myself in that place, like an altar or like uh, you know, the, the hot seat, if you will, where I literally put myself in front of that person and I said, how can God help you today? And yeah. actions spoke loud of the word. Now that man, he knows I'm a pastor and he hasn't fully come to Christ yet but he lets me talk to him about, about God. And you know what? His kids have come up to me and said, you're a pastor, right? I need you to pray for me because of this, that, or the other. And his kids have given their life to God. And so, and they're, they're, you know, adult uh, teen, you know, or almost adult teenagers <clears throat> and they talk. And so here's, what's going to happen is God's going to revive that entire family. He's going to bring them into a place of relationship. And what's going to happen to my neighbor on the left, the same thing and any neighbor that comes. And I'm just, you know, I just want to go for it. And so can I believe, yeah, I believe God to do things in the church, but how about my neighborhood? And I just think yeah. if we just begin to walk out some neighborly love, we're going to see revival. We're going to see people trusting God because what it is, is like, there's been a separation. And we got to, it's like, we have to come together, right? There's this prophecy. We're in this together. Well, we're in this together, separated. We need to be in this together, 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 <laughs> where we're literally holding hands and serving each other and being community. And there's a lot of beautiful examples out there, but to the church, I say, man, if the world's going to do it, take action. We can take action. And, uh, and so those are the things that are going to bring revival. I believe. Here's my problem. I can have these kind of conversations with Francisco for hours. I yeah, love yeah. picking his brain and just hearing him talk, but I know he's a man with many obligations throughout the day. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, so I'm going to give Francisco the final word, the final thought. Feel free to share whatever you want to share. Maybe I didn't get to ask a question. Something's on your heart. Maybe there's nothing that you want to share and you feel like you covered it all. But nevertheless, I'm giving you this opportunity to have the final word. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for letting me be uh, today on the, the Blacksmith Chronicles. I, I pray that all of your listeners are blessed uh, immensely by the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's where I'm at today. The Bible says, come with me. In Revelations 21, there's, these, uh, there's this angel that appears and 
he's an angel that's holding seven bowls and there's seven plagues. And the second part of that verse, he, there's an invitation to come with that angel to go and see the bride. Uh, in John 21, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, come with me. And so right now I'm in the come with me moment of my life uh, with Jesus. And when I was a kid, I would look at Revelations 21, for example, and I would look at that first part and I would dwell so much on the fact that there's going to be plagues, there's going to be destruction, there's going to be all these horrible things happening. And, uh, and you know what, that's probably right. Those things are probably definitely going to happen. They're in the Bible and we've already begun to see some. But what I want everyone to be hanging on to is the second part of that verse in Revelations 21, where it says, come with me and I will show you the bride. What God is saying is, come with me. I want to show you your glorious future. And for all those that are listening today, my heart is this, is I know there's a lot of hard things going on. And if you've suffered some really hard things in this time, it's been hard to, uh, to pastor through this season. And I'm sure for you, it's been hard in a lot of ways to trust. But if you could renew your commitment to God, if you could renew your intimate life with God, your covenant with God in such a way where you allow God to say to you, come with me and I will show you your glorious future. I promise you that you will not be disappointed. I promise you that God will meet with you. I promise you that if you put yourself in that place, that God will meet you where you're at, whether it's on the shore of the revival, whether it's in a room, whether it's at your neighbor's driveway, whether that's at the local coffee house, wherever that is, if you come with him, he will show you some things. And I pray that, that, God, that God blesses you and that you make an opportunity to do exactly that. Ryan, I love you, man. Uh, love you so much. I appreciate it. So good. How can people get connected with you, the church, the ministry? Give us some insight here. Oh, yeah, really easy to get a hold of us. Uh, we hold live services online. We've had a media mandate forever. And uh, as long as I've been in, in relationship with Patricia King and Robert Hodgkin. So definitely you can look us up through Patricia King Ministries or, of course, ShilohFellowship.com. We also have a YouTube channel. We have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. So definitely online resources. And if you ever have a question about our ministry, you can just hit us up at info at ShilohFellowship.com. We have people that love to pray. We have uh, call centers. We have all kinds of stuff uh, where people can even be get involved. We even have web church. We have an actual flourishing web church. So if you're in a hard to reach area of the world and you can't get to a local church, we come to you. And it's an amazing, amazing group of people. I am so proud of our web church. It is a interactive flowing body. They're not just there watching. They are part of the body. They are doing the work. And so it's absolutely amazing. So those are some of the ways you can connect with us here at Shiloh. I get to serve amongst an amazing body of pastors and believers, and they are absolutely amazing. And you're welcome to be a part of it. I uh, can't wait to get back out there and have some beef brisket. So I'm just going to oh. go ahead and put that out on the order. So just you got it, brother. I'm just, you know, this this comes from the guy who texts me and tells me that he's doing that, knowing that I'm not there. But you know, hey, I did it on purpose too, so you would come back. It was a lure. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. We see how we are. We play. Come we, on. That's how we play. That's how we do it. That's how. Yeah, that's yeah, how yeah. it's going to be. It's All right. Be. I see it. No. Nevertheless, guys, check them out connect with them. I know many of you already connected in some way, but continue checking up with everything they're doing. I consider it an honor and a privilege to have Francisco part of the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. I genuinely hope and pray that you have been encouraged in this episode. You have been equipped and you have been challenged by the word. Until the next episode, guys, be blessed and we love you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.